10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go! Live from Karls Hochschule International University in good old Germany, the new media culture late night show with Andreas Dickes, Thomas Zaber, Christine Weibre, Christian Stiegler, Patrick Breitner, and here's your host, Marcus John Henry Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Germany. Welcome to Baden-Württemberg. Welcome to Karlsruhe. Welcome to the heat of the city. It's bloody hot, isn't it? I have the best spot of the evening. I have that bit over there with the fan. But if you do this a little harder, maybe we can all get a little wind going. Well, thank you all very much for coming on this uh, hottest day of the year, I believe. Uh, maybe, yeah. Well, it is for me, because we live in Munich and it's very cold down there. It's not as hot as it is in Karlsruhe. So what is waiting for you this evening? What can we expect? Well, it's an evening of unicorns, of magic, of internet and memes and grumpy cats and Thomas Sorbach. <laughs> it's a, an evening about this book here. Do you all know about this book? Yes? Do you all have this book? Why not? <laughs> it's very simple. I do believe there are uh, copies this evening. Absolutely. Yes, that you can purchase. How many people here speak German? Well, there you go. You can read the book. How many, how many people here do not speak German? You do not need to buy the book. Unless, of course, you learn German really, really quickly. But it's got lots of really long words in it. But the Germans do that, they just stick the words together to confuse us. That's basically what they're doing. So, we've got um, most of the uh, um, authors of this book have, have come this evening to talk to us about what they've written. And here in these cameras is the internet as well. So a good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to Karlsruhe, wherever you may be. Our first author this evening is going to take us through something which he calls net smart. The kind of intelligence that you need to survive in this strange new media culture, which we're going to talk about this evening. So I'd like to have a huge round of applause, a Karlsruhe round of applause for Andreas Dittes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andreas Dittes, and I argue that media literacy will be one of the most important skills we have to teach our children so they will be able to compete in the worldwide marketplace that with an ever increasing variety of new tools and channels. And it's not important to know anything by heart but to know how to Google it. Wow. Hi. Have a seat. It's me. So, that was um, very quick. Yes, indeed. But there's a lot in there. Your chapter... In fact, just explain, introduce yourself to everybody. Who are you, what you do, and why can we talk to you about net smartness? Yeah, so uh, I'm Andreas. Uh, I'm a university dropout, actually, um, but also lecturer here at the university. And um, so I'm an entrepreneur. I dropped out to start my first company. Um, so I'm what you could call street smart, um, because like I learned everything by just doing it. And uh, yeah, that's short intro as well, but I guess it's fair enough, right? And that kind of leads into what you've written about in your chapter. Yes. So uh, the biggest part is like about uh, media literacy. So um, 
what's happening on the web right now and if like the, the understanding of media literacy we have right now is uh, good enough for what's 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 out there because like uh, it's just increasing the speed of new mediums the speed of new tools uh, we have to learn about them and to know how to how they, they act so for example um, who of you is on Facebook Almost all of you. So who has read the terms of service? <laughs> Big round of applause for these two guys. But that's, but, but that's only because I'm probably, with maybe the exception of one familiar face that I can see just over there, uh, because I'm older than all of you. With the exception of Thomas, maybe. I'm a, what, do you, what do you call it in your, in, in your chapter? I'm a digital immigrant. Yes, you would be one of them. What, just because I was born after, uh, between 1970 and 1980? Well, it has to do with age, but also like the, if you want to learn about it and if you actually use it. Okay. Um, so you could be a digital uh, native as well, just if you like, uh, are active, um, trying new tools, what you do. Okay. So you could be a native as well. So I have the potential to be a native. Yes. I'm rather proud about that. Okay, um, so what, what, are the, what will be the biggest skill set for young people kind of who go to university and then they finish university and they go out into the big wide world? What's the most important thing that they need to learn in this crazy new, which is not new anyway, but in this, this new culture, media culture thing that we're talking about tonight? So what's the, what's the biggest or the most important skill set that they need to learn? Uh, maybe not skill set, but you have to be curious about uh, what's going out there. Uh, and uh, so if, if you try to learn about all the new things, you can actually implement them and make use of them. Um, so we are in the um, startup space, we talk about something called growth hacking, which is basically making very good use of technology to be way better than any other company in marketing. Um, so if you know the tools and if you're curious about them and explore them, try them out, um, then you can actually be super good at them. Yeah. So curiosity would be one thing you have to be um, to succeed. Um, so is, in terms of all of, these, all of these things that you talk about in the book, you know, about this kind of like media critique stuff, media, I actually read the book. Imagine that. I did. I read, I read and it's in German. I didn't understand a word of it, but I read it. Um, I, I read all of it except for Patrick Brighton Buck's bit, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so I did actually read the book. So it's uh, so you're kind of like all this media critique stuff, media know-how, media make it, you know, the collaboration part. Um, it, that that seems to me kind of like a, a very complicated way of of doing kind of like stuff. So because you've got colleagues in I don't know Spain and in Japan and, and the United States and stuff, and all working on the same product. Um, is, is Germany kind of like is lagging behind in teaching young people those kind of skills? Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, so whenever you're in the US talking to Facebook, there's, um, there's a laugh about Germany because uh, we're the only nation who uses fake names on Facebook. Right? Uh, I mean, Facebook can figure out who you are anyway because they know your friends. And if they know the real names of your friends, they can um, like, uh, just like, trace it back to your real name. Um, but that's something that, that just comes up and just like just our culture that's very very different from it's not ex, um, explorative and, and all this stuff so we have to catch up quickly okay is that actually uh, is that actually a problem let's have a little think about that it doesn't matter that Facebook know who you are because your friends are maybe the just to kind of this whole anonym, anonymous stuff is more to do surely protecting your own privacy against other individuals within your community so that you have at least a, a minimal barrier against you and, I don't know, somebody else. Maybe if you're gay or lesbian, you don't really want to be associated with those kind of... or be lumped into... or, or be seen by, uh, I don't know, a, a Nazi group or something that may be in your area. That's totally true, but maybe you should uh, then not use your real profile to be in those groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but this, this whole kind of like privacy thing as well, or the culture that we live in, it, it feels like this is like this zero, zero margin economy that we live in where you don't actually have to pay for anything. You have access to loads of services and all you need to do is just kind of like give you a, um, your email 
That's great, isn't it? I mean, there's no problem with that, surely, he asks. I'm asking you that. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, there's nothing um, free. So whenever you sign up for a service that seems to be free, you always have to pay. Um, and in worst case, you pay with your data. Uh, and depends on what you give the service, like Facebook, um, they have a lot of data from you. They know your friends, they know what you like, the brands you like. So um, you pay massive amounts of information for Facebook, massive amounts of your own information. Okay. Can we hack that kind of stuff now? I mean, we could have a look at some stuff, sure. Okay. Yes. Should we you hack see it? Google? Yeah. Okay, uh, no, let's no, do it, no, 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 let's do it, let's do it, let's do it, no, no, no. Should we hack Google? Yeah. Let's close, no, 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 no. Shall we hack Google? Yeah. Okay, off we go. So there we are, that's, that's kind of, that's better. So, okay, what's, what's that? Um, so that's Google Maps and... Um, Maybe you know about TARDIS. This is just like a, a fun thing Google does. So it's, it's a regular Google Maps. And uh, if you go to this little phone booth, you're inside TARDIS. Right? Okay. That's cool. So this is more like a gimmick. Now let's get to the real stuff. OK, hang on. Does everybody here know, know the TARDIS? Oh, maybe you have to explain it. OK, the, um, the universe is controlled by um, Time Lords. And there's only one left. It's, he's called Doctor, Doctor Who. And this is real. <laughs> this isn't made up. And that's it. No, I'm serious. <laughs> and this is his spaceship. It's called the TARDIS. And it, on the outside, it looks like an old British telephone box. But on the inside, it's a spaceship. And it's big. So there we are. And it's on Google Maps. So it must be real. It must be. Sorry, Andreas, carry on. OK, so uh, let's start with some easy stuff. So for example, um, we could say, let's see some private files. So if you do a Google search and use this exact search string, you will find a lot of people who seem to have hosted some private files. And we could, of course, we're not clicking there, but... Can we have a um, look? Can we have I don't a know, look at I some... I don't know, maybe. Should we click one Would you like to look at some private files on Google? Yeah. You see, you lot of just... Let's see. Oh, I don't know. Okay, this is, this is boring, that's boring. Okay, that's boring. Maybe, maybe we can move to another one. Um, See, this is interesting, isn't it? If, if we're in Germany, and if you, if you go up to, you know, there's a, there's some of you are German. If I went up to you in Germany and said, would you, would you mind us on a late night show in a university is being filmed with an audience of, you know, millions? Um, if we look to your... <laughs> It's true. Uh, with uh, look at your uh, private files, you go no data no. Private, data, privacy. But as an audience, you say yes, we want to see the data private. Is there anything else private we can look at? Because they're just gagging um, for so it. So there's one you can, for example, you know Dropbox. Who of you has Dropbox? Ah, come on. Okay. Uh, and I'm not, we're not going to expose anyone in the audience. But um, if you have a Dropbox, uh, it might be syncing to some um, drive that's actually indexed in Google. So you see a lot of people and their Dropboxes here synced in Google. So you can just access those files. Okay. Which is a little bit creepy. Um, moving on. So, so <laughs> for, for example, um, <laughs> there, there's a lot of websites which have a thank you HTML or something like that, which is basically the website after you buy something or when they give you a present. And if you search for this stuff, for example, you find websites. Let's just click on this one maybe. Um, so it looks like we are signed up or even paid for something, and now we can download all these presentations here. <gasps> Audio transcripts. Yeah, but you're not going to do that, are you? Because that's, no. you know. That's, it's just for scienti scientific reasons, you know? No. Um, okay, hey, stop taking pictures down here. <laughs> stop that. It's copyright. <laughs> it's copyright. Okay, mo moving on. Um, and it's actually really not allowed to play them because this would be uh, no. But don't play them here because the against the law. But get but into trouble here, wouldn't yeah, they? Yeah, it's, it's just to show how easy it is. So you can put in anything. Just say index of, and then just like index of files will uh, will show up, and you can put anything. In this example, 170,000 Pink Floyd albums laying there somewhere. Okay, hang on a minute, uh, Andreas. Should we ask some people here what they'd like to see? See sure. if somebody, would anybody like to see something? Would anybody like to see? Is there anything you'd like to see? 
Any files, any secrets? What about you? What's your name? Uh, Francis. Francis. What would you like to see? Some secrets of the internet. Look at secrets of the Karlsholschule. Secrets <laughs> of the Karlsholschule. Oh. I, I'm, I'm legally not allowed to expose those, but maybe we can have a look at uh, government files. Would you like to Is look at fine? <laughs> would you like to look at government files? Yeah, of Greek. Okay. Of Greece. Of Greece. Government files of Greece. Politic hyper relevant. Ba ba bank accounts. Hyper relevant. Um, we, we actually, we can, um, we can do something like this, which is uh, I'm just looking at documents laying on governmental um, uh, drive spaces, and only PDFs and only ones w which are have confidential in it. Um, and there you have some. I think we looked at this one before, which is not too super secret because it's uh, just a NASA, you know. Um, is NASA okay, Francis? Yeah, it's all right. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's is that nervous. secret enough for you? Yeah. Can you go home and say you've seen NASA documents? Yeah. That's, that's cool. Good. All right. Look at that confidential. So, so this seems like a, a voice tape transcription from, I don't know, some space mission or something. Okay. Um, Francis, well done for making him do something that we'd already planned to do, but that was excellent. Would you like something to drink? You look very thirsty. Uh, uh, would you, have you ever had an Epler, an apple wine? With maracuya saft. No, I didn't. Uh, no well, you're going to now. Would you like a Wilde Hirsch? Yeah. Can we have a round of applause for Francis for asking in a very pertinent question? There you go. There's a present for you. What else can you show us, Andreas? Show us yeah, something else. Uh, let's go, go quickly. Maybe um, if you need to find out some passwords. So uh, there's an easy way. Uh, so I'm just searching for Excel files because there's many passwords in Excel files sometimes. Uh, and I'm just looking for one of the most common passwords, which is one, two, three. And then you see a lot of uh, files coming up, username, or blah, password, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is interesting, or you could also do a more advanced search like this one, it's looking for password, login, kunde, and only log files. And then stuff like this comes up, UGN, password, kunde, whatever. Kunde is what? Customer. Ah, German for customer. Sorry. Yes. Translation for okay, so there. maybe one last one, um, and I'm going to use my own profile picture for this. You can do a reverse Google search, a reverse image search on Google, which means Google is fingerprinting a, a picture you upload uh, and then trying to find similar pictures. So I'm going to do this with my, my picture. Oops, my picture here. It's Let's very pretty. See. You can also follow Andreas on Twitter. You can follow me at Dittus. Uh, do we have a hashtag for this evening, by the way? New media, New media culture. culture, hashtag. Okay, so uh, now I was just searching for my own picture here. Uh, and you see New Media Culture. It's actually, it's funny. It's uh, the first result here. Um, New Media Culture coming up. Uh, also other websites where I am and uh, like... And you actually, Bill Gates. <laughs> it's not fake. Bill Gates. Andreas, Bill Gates and you. Yeah, it's Got a uh, thing seems going. to be a connection, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it. Okay. So, so you need to be able to navigate your, your way around this new media culture stuff. You need exactly. to be able to protect yourself against this stuff. I would suggest not using a password, one, two, don't three, four. Don't put Dropbox on a web server. Uh, like don't it. put Dropbox on a web search. Ladies and gentlemen, Andreas Ditters, please, a round of applause. Thank you very much. So if we could all have a quick round of this, if you could just do this for a little bit, that'd be good. Get the air, because it just get it. Yeah, that's nice. We opened the uh, the windows earlier, and we discovered that it's five degrees hotter outside than it is actually in here. So, apropos hot, thousands of years ago, well, a thousand years ago. Romans would flock to the Colosseum to see their favorite gladiators be ripped to pieces by wild animals. Today, we flock to the Apple Store to sleep for days on end and queue in nasty puddles of our own making uh, to worship at the altar of the iPhone. Our next two guests call this phenomenon ultra-fandom. 
And that's what they're going to present to us now. So a massive, great, big, new media, culture, late night show. Round of applause for Christina Weidbrecht and Thomas Sorbach. <laughs> Everybody wants fans today, but not every fan is created equal. The new media culture has given rise to the, a new type of fan, the ultra fans. Ultra fans are highly emotional, extremely well connected and organized, and extremely creative and productive. They all share the same need. They want to immerse themselves in their fan world. But they're also hypercritical. The difference between regular fans and ultra fans is that regular fans are not as invested as ultra fans. They take it to, a new, uh, to an entirely new level. They consider themselves stakeholders of the brand or the fan object. They want to co-create, they want to co-produce, and they want to have a say in what happens with their fan object. They consider themselves owners of the fan object. So to all you brand managers out there, don't count your fans on Facebook. Instead, identify your ultras and relate to them. I'd, I'd do it for you, but I can see you're managing quite well on your own, Thomas. Uh, while Thomas is doing that, Christina, would you like to introduce yourself to this charming audience? I'm Black Widow. Okay. I was going to ask you that, any, why are you dressed like that? I'm in cosplay, which is one of the word, one of the ways in which fans express themselves. Okay. And so I'm dressed as Black Widow from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Avengers. Let us Iron let's Man. do a, a little research. Who of you do know Black Widow? Please raise your hands. Oh. Does she do her deserve her own movie? Yeah. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> okay. And Thomas, you're dressed as. Not as a Bayern Munich fan. Okay. <laughs> Is that a serious question? <laughs> I mean, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, um, of uh, Commerzbank, which is why I've come <laughs> as a banker this evening. Um, so, it just interesting. Okay, uh, when you're not being Black Widow, <laughs> introduce yourself. Who are you? So, my name is Christine Weidbrecht. I'm um, 
two things. I'm uh, on during the day. I work as a blogger relations manager for a cosmetics company, which our bloggers are kind of our ultra fans. And uh, by night or on the side, I also work as a consultant and I consult on transmedia and um, on new media projects okay. and with the marketing, with pitches and so on. Okay, cool. Do, we, do you all know Thomas? No, <laughs> I don't. Okay, if you <clears throat> allow me, um, I'm, as I said, I'm Thomas and um, I'm running an agency and we are dealing with viral marketing and over the last 10 years, um, we find out while doing this work that in the end, if it works, we create um, enthusiastic customers, um, also known as fans. That sometimes creates problems because companies are not prepared with very emotional people because sometimes, yeah, they're exhausting. You have to talk to them. You, they are just not, a, they are not more than a database. They have like needs which you have to fulfill and that's um, how I came across this um, fandom topic. Okay. Um, so, these ultra fans, they're a, they're a bit, bit nutty, aren't they? I mean, they can't... He says that while I'm sitting here. <laughs> I mean, it's, a bit, it's very kind of like... It's, kind of the, it's an interesting thing in, in, in the chapter of your book that you kind of say that there's a very fine line between very, very... Um, very immersed in, in the whole story world, the, the, the brand or the story, in, in your case, the, the Marvel Universe? Marvel Universe. Um, did you get that wrong? Um, and to becoming completely fanatical and a bit of a, a, bit of a problem. How, do you, how, can a, how can a company or, a, or, a, or a, a media asset like Marvel or how can a brand like the Commerce Bank <laughs> um, manage those kind of relationships? It's sometimes very, very difficult. It takes the, the franchise Star Wars, for example, what we've just seen here was um, the first real trailer, but there was before a, 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 a teaser trailer, which you probably know, and there was some really tough discussions among fans. Maybe you can um, conclude. Well, there, there are always tough discussions amongst fans because um, they're all so involved in their fan objects and everyone knows best. And as, as, as we said in our introduction, they believe that you know they want to co-produce, they want to direct where um, something's heading, whether that's a brand or a storyline. And so, with the teaser trailer, there was you know p fans weren't sure whether it was really reflecting the Star Wars spirit, whether it was just um, as bad as episodes one, two, three, which were released at the beginning of uh, the two thousands. Um, and they were also, you know, there was a new type of lightsaber introduced that had three blades and, you know, lots of people were saying, well, you're going to kill yourself with that one. Um, like, so there, there are always discussions. Um, there are always fights in between the fandoms. Mm. Um, actually, recently, you know, when the Avengers, last Avengers movie came out, the creator, Joss Whedon, got a lot of flack for um, several things that were in the in the movie that fans felt weren't portrayed right and they they were really really taking out on twitter okay as as the owner of a franchise they have to consider something that is called the canon which is like the framework or the rules um, mm -hmm. of a fandom and uh, the tricky thing is that today's uh, digital natives or ultra fans consider them them as owners of, of the canon as well, they participate to this canon, and it's much harder to control it in a way than it was mm. in earlier times. And so I think when you're a brand or a creator and you, ha you want to talk to ultra fans and you want to include them, then I think the most important thing is that you are actually open to them. So if you make that decision, only make it if you are willing to have some heated discussions maybe, and to, um, you know, if if you're willing to maybe have them have a say and you can create you know you can dictate the terms on which they can have a say because that ultimately it's your property and mm. you own it legally um, but you like I think you would actually benefit from like different perspectives that fan of fans offer they know your your stuff better than you you do yourselves mm. so for example George R. R. Martin who created the game of like the, well the Song of Ice and Fire the original book series which was then turned into Game of Thrones 
um, he actually employs two ultra fans because he kind of lost track of continuity and wasn't quite sure, like, because they sent a letter to him at some point, I think after the second book was out, saying, you know, you say this happened at that time in the chronology, but that doesn't really match up because you then you say this and this happened, and he hadn't noticed, and so he, you know, invited them, and they knew everything, and so he's got them as fact checkers now, so when he okay. writes a book, they check whether that could all be plausible within the timeline. Wow. <laughs> so... Uh, and this this uh, this uh, word ultras, um, Thomas, you're wearing the kit of my favourite football team. Do you all know who, which football really? team this is? Yes, it is. Do you, who knows this football team? Um, I guess yeah, we're on Karlsruhe, and uh, what from what I know, there are some difficult. There's a difficult tension between. Um, Eintracht fans and fans of um, Karlsruhe, is that true? No, there's no, no, no? There's no tension there at all. Oh, okay, no that's good. No, <laughs> no. no. Yeah, so, but the so term, where does, where the term does come ultra yeah. um, is borrowed from, uh, is, is a Latin term actually, and means going beyond the, the normal. And we, um, we borrowed this term to describe an observation we, uh, we made in, in our practical work. Um, uh, the, the term actually is, is used, as, as some of you know, that are involved in, in football um, from, the, from the football area. And um, it, it was created in the 1960s in Italy, um, where fans um, began to organize themselves. And this is um, a very important factor when we talk about ultra-fandom. It is always organized. And... Um, this is one, one, one indicator that something is, is about to change in regard to fandom. As, as we said in, in, in the introduction, um, when I talk to, to, my, to my clients, um, they, they, they talk a lot about fans, but they actually do not have any idea what they are talking about. Um, this is what annoys me um, uh, sometimes. And they're totally not, not ready to, de to, do, to deal with, with, with organized and very, very highly emotional uh, people. I mean, this is something you talk about again in your chapter that the, the whole kind of emotional fabric or the setup of these fans is very, very complicated. It's like, I've, I've written it down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's 10 separate kind of like units that you've identified as like making up the fabric of, a, of an ultra fan. So is it, I, I presume that countries in countries like Japan, they're much more used to dealing with that kind of that kind of fabric, that kind of emotional setup, but in, again in Germany, because we're in Germany, so we might as well talk about Germany, the German companies and uh, brands struggle with this kind, of, this kind of immersive fan, ultra fan. Is that right? It, to my mind, in, in, in other uh, countries like the US and maybe Japan, this phenomenon is much more um, accepted in a way. Um, in, in Japan, uh, they, they call that otaku, um, uh, and well, as we know, in, in the United States, they, talk, they, they are called geeks or, or nerds sometimes. In Germany, um, what, what I observe um, when I'm talking about uh, my clients with, um, about fandom, it's, it's often like it has a very negative connotation. Like, um, oh, these crazy people, are they really, do they have too much time? Uh, they should get a life. And, and I think this is something that should really, really change because um, brands um, somehow can, can really benefit um, from, from fans if they do it right, if they really um, try to connect to these people. And I think it's also actually quite sad that, you know, are, fans are dismissed in that way often because, you know, all they do is live a passion. Yeah. And, you know, if someone else was a passion, you know, a passionate athlete or a passionate, you know, chess player, everyone would be like, who knows? That's really cool. And but when someone immerses themselves in whether that be a story or, you know, even a brand, you know, they they find something worthwhile for them in it and they decide to pursue that passion. And um, I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Just yeah. like l leave them be and um you know, I think sometimes I sometimes I respect the fact that you know they spend so much time on one thing and then they know it really well. You know whether that you find that useful personally, then you know that mm. doesn't really matter. 
you know, it has to be useful to them. <laughs> yeah. Some fans here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, one last question, because uh, Joe, uh, can we have a big round of applause for the tech guys here, particularly Joe, who's shouting at me and waving at me all the time. He's been getting very, very cross with me all day today, just throwing sharp objects at me. Just one last, one last question before we move on. Um, did, I mean, Ultra Phantom isn't... It's always kind of, of been there, but how has the, the, you know, the internet and, and community... How has it changed the Ultra Fan community? How, how, how has it...? Well, speaking partially from mm. experience, because I actually... You know, I lived before the, well, before the spread of the internet, before it was widely available. Um, so fandom itself and ultra fandom has always been there. They're the first, like, Star Trek, you know, fan magazines were written in the beginning of the 70s. Um, a lot of, you know, fan art, fan fiction was circulated way before then. But if you were a fan and, you know, let's say you live in a small village and there's 200 people and nobody you know, has the same interest, then you don't have access to a fan club that's locally, you know, you don't have access to anything. Whereas nowadays, you know, you, you can have anything at any point. You can talk to fellow fans, you can share, um, you know, f fan knowledge. They create wikis for every every mm. single show or any anything that ever, I think, hits the thing. Um, there's, yeah, fan art, fan fiction, and you can you can access your fan object at any time. So back in, in you know the 90s when I was a fan of stuff um, I had to wait you know until Saturday at 5 p.m. to hope that my German you know new TV station would have the new episode and not show an old one and one that's actually in chronological order and all of that whereas nowadays that doesn't matter because I can watch anything at any time um, sometimes legally sometimes not mm. <laughs> and <laughs> And I can also, and, th and this is one thing for you know fans, they can re-watch stuff and they can analyze it and then they can exchange about it, they can talk about it. And so the whole connectivity just fuels fandom in so many different ways that it really gives you know, rise to that ultra fandom. You know what? Yeah. Joe, I, f I feel something coming on. Uh, and I think, I think it's gamification. I feel a little game. Come on, can we have a round of applause for the gamification phase of the new media? Yes. Are you ultra? So. That was very good. <laughs> that was a bit of a surprise. So, guys, I reckon that there's at least one ultra fan here in this room. What do you think? Well, Other than you Judging guys. from... The, this, this you know, the, the, the reception Here. we got earlier, Here. I think they may what do you think? Some. Thomas, go, should I, uh, go should and I ask. ask. Go and see if you can find someone. And if, we f and if we find more than one, then the round of applause will dictate who wins a prize. And guess what the prize is? It's a book. So, go and so um, who considers her or him as um, a fan of something? You? Come on. I'm up here in cosplay. There's nothing you can do to embarrass yourself at this point. I think you look absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, Thank maybe you. Uh, Cologne Soccer Club as well. Cologne Soccer Club. Come on. <laughs> okay, so, so we have here a fan okay. of the Cologne Football Club. Does he get a round of applause for that? Sure. Yes. Yes, he does. <laughs> well, okay. Okay, so at the moment you're ahead. At the moment you're at the okay. absolutely number one on getting the book. So uh, what was his name, by the way? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um... Philip. 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 Oh, and what, what's your name? Yeah, Francis. Um, She's Francis again. again. Yeah. <laughs> She's a fan of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so how about your fandom? Um, well, I think as many people who won't admit it, I'm a fan of Nine Gag. You're a fan of Nine Gag. Yeah. Okay, she, Francis, who's already won a can of, uh, what is it called? Wilde Hirsch. Wilde Hirsch is a fan of Nine Gag. Round of applause. Philip, it's kind of not looking good for a you. A third right person, now. maybe? Come on, a third person. No fan of anything. Are you guys not watching any TV yeah. shows? I, I'm a fan of something. Like, yeah. What do you do? Do you just sit? Yes. Like, Somebody here, here we in go. the front. <laughs> They're a fan of beer. They just opened I beer. just bought five beers, so I guess I'm You're a fan, a fan of, of beer. 
Okay, what's your name? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah. What's, your, your, what's name? your name? David. David is a fan of beer. Does David win a book? <laughs> what do you guys think? Well, I, I think... Um, the Wait, it's, up to, it's up to you. You are the experts. These yeah. guys are the experts on ultra fandom. So what, what, what would you say? Well, maybe he can... Like, if he's a fan... Like, maybe they can all tell us a little bit. So, you know, if David... Like, David, how many beers have you drunk in your life? And... <laughs> What would and you do, like, on, how David? How many games what, have you been to? What, and... what would you do? What would you do for beer, David? Go in. I mean, <laughs> what would you do for a beer? Express your fandom. You would pay for a beer, David. You're not winning a book, so <laughs> you're simply not going to win a book. So, uh, Phil, uh, Philip, uh, what would you do? What What's the most extreme thing you've ever done for your football club? You went to visit them at the training So you stalk camp. them, is what you're saying. You stalk them. <laughs> did you follow them around there every, everywhere? Did you kind of take photographs of them? And, and, and did you kind of like cry when they didn't look at you? You put them on Dropbox. <laughs> okay. Francis, it's looking really good for you right now. I'm actually a fan of something. I'm a, ma I'm a massive fan of something. Are you a Hoovian? A bigger one? A Hoovian. No, well, I used to be. I'm a big fan of Inspector Barnaby. My mom is too. I have watched every single episode of Inspector Barnaby. How many times? That's uh, done in that's the, you know how much film that is. Each episode is one and a half hours and there are 98 of them. How about an applause for him? Yeah. <laughs> and just to prove, just to prove how big a fan I am of Inspector, Inspector Barnaby. Patrick, have you got your phone? Can you call me please? Do you, do you all know Inspector Barnaby? Yeah? So, Patrick, just give me a call. This is not rehearsed. This isn't rehearsed. We're just doing this now because I just want to show you what real fandom is. He has number. Yes. <laughs> he erased your number. Damn. Here we go. Here we go. So we have to stop that now because of Gamer. Right. Okay, so what are we going to do with the book? What are we going to do with the book? Who gets the book? So, round of applause for Philip. <laughs> round of applause for Francis. <laughs> round of applause for David. <laughs> David gets the book. So, and a big round of applause for Thomas and for Christina, please. Ultra fandom was... Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Come, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, going, going. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So, Joe, how are we looking for time? How are we looking for time? We have to take the next guest. We have to take the next guest. Hang on. Let's have a, who, who is the next guest? Oh, hello. Oh, hello. I think some of you may know the next guest. Our next guest explores the world of the seemingly awesome and the theater of the self. It's a subject that Roland Barthes, Walter Benjamin, and Baldrillard would have just loved to have get, gotten their teeth into. Unfortunately, Mr. Dr. Professor Christian Stiegler got there first. Mr. Stiegler, please. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm going to show you some nasty pictures today. So. Um, Few discretion is advised. Yeah, some of the stuff is really harsh. Yeah, so if you haven't eaten anything, it's too late. <laughs> We start off with something very easy. This is a quarker. I, I mean, I'm the right one. The right one is a quarker. It's a it's a fluffy Australian animal, sort of related to a rat, in the, in the tradition of a kangaroo. And it was a trend that people made selfies, selfies with them. Yeah? There are dozens of them. Uh, this is one of my students. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> And that is what you call public shaming. This is public shaming. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. So I have a thesis. And my thesis is selfies are embodied narratives. So they tell something. This picture told your story and through which, which we constitute and replace, this is important, we replace ourself and the world. Yeah? And we call this automediality. 
think about this so you learn something. This is one of the few st first selfies ever. This guy practically painted himself through a convex mirror. And if you ever watch yourself through a mirror, you notice you don't see yourself the way that you are. You see yourself mirror reversed. And this is now a convex mirror. So everything is out of shape. His hand is much bigger than his face. This is actually the first kind of filter. Yeah? Think about filter and Instagram, what you're doing on there. So we're living in a world in which we practically look for an image cult and the perfect cult image. We live in the generation, me, 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 yeah? full of narcissism. This is you. <laughs> People who want to be in the middle of everything. Celebrities who want to be in the middle of everything. She's my hero. Kim Kardashian published a book full of her selfies. And she called it selfish. I mean, she's super clever. Yeah? And this is an, in an old tradition, by the way, uh, goes back to Andy Warhol and his star Polaroids. You see a couple of famous people here. You probably recognize uh, Muhammad Ali, maybe John McEnroe, so famous people. And well, the most famous selfie is probably the Oscar selfie. Yeah, you remember that. So through your iPhone, through your uh, smartphone, through your iPad, whatever you're using, you start to touch yourself through the medium. So the medium is part of an extension of your body. We notice from other parts as well, like the camera or the selfie. No matter where you are. No matter where you are. And this is the generation selfie. The generation selfie is selfie-ish. You see, there's a guy doing suicide while she is doing actually a photo while the guy wants to hop up the Brooklyn Bridge. There is no self-respect anymore, yeah? Obama and Cameron made a selfie at a funeral, yeah? You have seen these pictures. And now we go to the more offensive part, yeah? This is the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. People love to do selfies there because they think it's cool. She even got a shitstorm for it. Please notice the smiley. Notice the reactions. But it's not only Germany, yeah? I mean, people are at ground zero, they do the same. So we embody our narratives through the media. And the most important thing, obviously, is the face. Because if you do a selfie, the face is mostly important, important part out of it. This guy actually started off the whole selfie thing because he shot a video of himself every day for six years. You probably have seen the original or you have seen the copy on The Simpsons. This is, goes long back to art, the deconstruction of the face. Yeah, you, you probably have seen this one. Maybe you know this one. Maybe you know this one. <laughs> this is a cello tape selfie. People are weird. People are really weird. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that image on a little bit to see what this guy was doing. So we're moving away. It's a very sexual thing, right? Touching yourself. <laughs> Think about it. So we're going back from the face and go to other body parts, which is in this case the, yeah. Yeah, it's your ass. And we have professional sticks for it the selfie sticks, or in this case, the belfie sticks, to make a perfect photograph of a body part. Not your face anymore, now it's your ass. So you should be careful what will be the next trend on the internet regarding selfie, because there is always a new one, and there is always a fluffy animal to do a photo with. And this time, I mean also the right one. Thank you very much. So we touch ourselves. We do. I hope you all did and continue to do. Frequently. <laughs> Frequently, more than once a day. Yeah, we do. So when, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while. It takes a while. Think oh, about I'm glad, it. I'm, I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad we now just have unicorns. I'm more happy with a unicorn than with the, the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
are you pictures, okay? Pictures you in my head. some wilder huge? Pictures in my head are really kind of... What happened there? Where did that come from? Oh. Um, I, this is called a photobomb. Yeah. Yeah. So... I really like the, a friend. Of, a friend of when when I 2006 when I started blogging 2006, a friend of mine always had like a photos on his blog, which was him, um, kind of like doing awesome stuff. It took me ages to work out that because I'm stupid, that he was taking the photographs himself because that was before we had like words like selfies and stuff. It was just like and because like, I thought he had like a, a film crew that were going around with him all all of the time, so. And I was really disappointed when I found out it was just him doing it himself. But that isn't isn't that also a bit about this whole uh, the, the kind of like the magic for the for the person for the individual of the selfies that you kind of you're framing yourself in this world of awesomeness. You you never take a selfie of yourself having a miserable time, do you? I mean, there was a time when people actually went to the Eiffel Tower in Paris and asked people to take a photo of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And nowadays you do your selfie. So the progress is more or less the same, um, but it's not really narcissism. I, I hate when people say it's about narcissism. Yeah, of, obviously, it's a me, me, me generation, yeah, mm. but it's not really only because you tell a story. And we always did this through media. We always shoot videos. We always try to write something, stories, took pictures. So this is not, nothing new. What changed through the internet is the way of... Um, we do it everywhere. Yeah? Mm. I can do a selfie on the toilet and it would be still fun. I had done this before. <laughs> I... Um I have a history of doing things on toilets. <coughs> As Patrick will tell you. I mean, um, yeah, but it, it, it's kind of interesting. It's like this whole, he's, it's just like this whole framing of, of, of stuff. I saw, I'll give you an example. It's like framing yourself, say, in, your, in a particular, telling a story about yourself. I saw, I saw a tweet from a, a, um, a friend of mine who lives, also lives in Munich. Oh, never drink gassy water when you're doing moderation for a show. It's a very stupid idea. Um, he saw somebody buy an ice cream, take a photograph of himself with the ice cream, and then threw the ice cream away. So it's kind of like this whole kind of like telling stories and, and framing yourself in a particular... Exactly. And, and the, something that I call... Is it a term? The downy? The downy, it's yeah, called the yeah. Do you all know what a downy is? It's like when you, you <laughs> oh yeah, it's the it's the shot that you take when you from up up the top, because your face looks better. Because you you if you take it from the down, everything hangs down. <laughs> you young, lovely young things, you do not know about this. Us old people over forty, we know about this because it all hangs. And there was still a time you also remember that probably when people stand in front of their mirror. To take a selfie of yeah. themselves. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, Lifties. standing, checking, checking your outfit, standing in front of the mirror, not looking in the mirror, but taking a photo of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Lifties. Lifties. Yeah. Lifties. Who's yeah. who's ever taken a lifty? Yeah, look, there we have Francis. Obviously, <laughs> Francis is. <laughs> Does she have a book already? Francis, do you have a book already? No, I'm not ah, sure. We're gonna she's doing very well. Out. Very well. Um, but the, okay, that's all kind of kind of cool and uh, or cool. That's all kind of okay, and we can kind of frame that, and it's kind of understandable. But this um, take us uh, through this um, this phenomenon of selfies in a serious. You call it in the book selfies in a serious place. That's that's fright uh, in terms of the stupidity or the the ignorance of that. That's quite frightening. So so what are we seeing there culturally? I wouldn't call it ignorance, you know, because we. We, no, we behave differently. We, we have certain images and we have certain frames. Again, this is a stage. Uh, even a funeral is a stage. You want to tell people you were at this funeral, that it might be inappropriate to do a picture there. This is something else. The fun thing is, people who watch this picture of the funeral might not even think in the first place this is inappropriate. Mm. They might think, oh, she was at a funeral. This is exactly what you want to tell. The only, the only real offensive thing was the guy with the penis, or the two penises, right? It was, it was, and it's three, three, okay, I didn't even, I need, not even I did look so close on it. Who, who said that? Who said, who said it was it okay? It was over here. Oh, you, you, you know what? No, you're going to get a, <laughs> you're gonna, a round of applause for, that's okay. There you go. Seriously. There you are. I think you're thoroughly deserving of a... A, and you are, st you are studying there a you master's go. program here at Castle Schule. Excellent. Isn't She's this a, a great advertisement good. for us? Exactly. No, that's okay. That's okay. 
No. That's true. Free dean. Oh, you notice it only because you study a master's yeah. program. <laughs> free, free dildo sellotape to somebody's face is absolutely okay. Um, what's the difference between a self-portrait and a selfie? Well, a self-portrait needs a little bit more of time. Yeah? Mm. I mean, you certainly have to think about what you're doing. Yeah? I mean, especially when we saw this guy th painting himself through a mirror. I mean, this takes a lot of time. So you have to think about constantly how you shape yourself. Mm -hmm. It's different in the selfie because you, it's a click of a button. Yeah? So it's not really, of course, people try to frame themselves perfectly because they all want to look good. That's why you also have to filter. But on the other hand, it's not that long of time. That's an interesting point. Uh, from all of you here, how many of you know exactly which is your best side, your, your chocolate side, your, the bit where, okay. Yeah, because well, with me it's down here. It's it's just down down. It's just yeah. like that. It's about that. It hurts. It's much to do. better. It's much better than before. It hurts to do, but it is it is actually it is actually quite good. Do you, Doctor Professor, I have a I have a feeling. I don't know. Do you have a Do you have like a tingling sensation going through your body right Since now? Since the first moment. Since you sat down. Absolutely. But it's peaking. It's peaking more it's now. It's peaking. Joe, I think there's something peaking live on stage right now here. Can we have a round of applause because it's gamification time! It is indeed. So. Oh, it's the selfie shredder. Okay, so I believe it's the selfie shredder. It's the selfie shredder. So I believe... I believe that you and your team have... What, do, what were you doing earlier today? Yeah, we, we did a selfie corner over there. So the goal was practically to do you sh to shoot the worst selfie you ever did. You had a couple of stuff over there. Of course, there is a price. Guess what? It's a book. It's a book. We Co sell so well, we can give them away for free. Okay. <laughs> no, that's wrong. <laughs> no, it's okay. So, and these are, and, and I've actually got them here. I've, never, I've not seen them before. So I'll give, you the, I'll give you the first one. Oh my God! Okay, yes, so this is, this is shitty because I'm on it. Okay, so that's that we shred that straight away. We'll just get rid, we'll just get rid of that straight away. No, just shred it because yeah, you're in it. No, you, you know can't. We, no, just get rid of it. All right, shred all right, all right. Round of applause for the shredding of the selfie, please. Shred the selfie. Shred it. Shred it. Shred it. Listen to listen to the sound of your your soul is being freed of that selfie. Excellent. Well done. Okay. So, and what do we have here? Who is it? Do you know these people? Unfortunately, no one. <laughs> okay, who is, who, who, who is this? Well, this is Professor Frank Wiedmeier. Uh -huh. um, who's the guy next Where is to he? you? My son. Your son, uh -huh, that uh -huh. poor fellow. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. Do we, uh, uh, okay, a round of applause if you think this is really, really awful. No, it's, it's cute. fine. It's so cute. Sorry, Frank, you're not going to win the book, it's but so you're cute. going in the shredder. Shred the, shred yeah, the selfie. So shred the selfie. But shred so it. Cute. No, shred it. Round of applause Sorry. for the selfie. Shredding. Shred it. <laughs> Awful. Awful. Oh, your son. Okay, okay. Such a nice guy. Uh, uh, yeah, this is shit. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, okay, well... A round of applause for this terrible selfie. Obviously, Patrick can't win because, um, well, he's got a copy of the book. Uh, Not that I know of. <laughs> no, actually, oh, okay. actually, no, he gave me, he gave me his. But he's going in the shredder anyway. Yeah, yeah so a round of applause for that shredding. <laughs> Joe, do we have time for one more? I think we have, one, we have time for one more. And, and, and I think this could be a winning... Uh, when, well, there's loads of people on it, so they might have to share the book. They have to share the book. It depends on how, how loud everybody claps right now. So you make sure you hold it into the internet. Absolutely. That's that camera there. You're going, the people on this selfie are now going onto the internet. I can, I can see them slightly panicking because they know what's coming. So there we go. There we go. So a loud round of applause for that selfie there. I mean, it's, it's really awful. <laughs> Sadly... In the shredder. In the shredder. In the shredder. So, there it goes. Goodbye. Oh, but your soul will be freed. And you get to share one of these wonderful books. Only one. How many, how many of there are you? What? Five. One, two, three, four. Oh, come on. One. Share it. Two, three, 
four. Here, can you help, help me? You. Can you help me here? Five. So a big round of applause for these five charming young ladies here. <laughs> Excellent. There we go. And a massive round of applause for Mr. Stiglar. There we go. And that's very good. Well, very good. And that kind of, Joe, I do believe, leads us to... Joe, what, what, it's our next guest, isn't it? What? Oh, it's selfie. Oh, let's do a selfie. Mit der Wilde Hirsch. Oh, by the way, I should tell you something. Wilde Hirsch, ladies and gentlemen, is available now <laughs> at the Edeka here in Karlsruhe. It's uh, delicious. I've not, I'm going to try it in a minute. Okay, so here we go. Uh, uh, selfie. Do, do. Uh, uh, come on, stand up, everybody. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, stand up. Stand up, stand up. Make sure your boob tube's up. Yep. Right, come on. Wait. Don't look. The other side. What's the best? Side? Ooh. My. Okay. Ready? There we go. There we go. There we go. Ooh. Ooh. There we go. Selfie time. Selfie time. Selfie time. Selfie time. Selfie time. Excellent. Selfie time. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the very last green card, which means we have come to our very. Let me have a look. Yes, we've come to a, uh, our very last guest for this evening. I have, um, I have known our final guest. Oh, do keep it down with the Wilde Hirsch. Um, I've known our last guest, our next and last guest, uh, since 2017. And we've argued with each other ever since. We've argued about marketing, we've argued about advertising, we've argued about smoking, we've argued about beer, we've argued about his beard. And this evening, we probably will argue about a subject that neither of us can pronounce properly. Ladies and gentlemen, the hugest of possible rounds of applause for your very own Mr. Patrick Breitenbach. My name is Patrick Breitenbach. <laughs> <laughs> And I claim that memes are the source code of our culture and society. You might say that memes are just funny pictures of grumpy cats or maybe face palming Star Trek commanders circulating around the internet. You might say that memes are just little viral advertising spots for old spicy soaps. Or weird shaking dances from Harlem. Or an efficient way to waste a lot of water. But I say the concept of memes is much more than that. I claim our whole existence belief system, socialization, our behavior, our whole reality is based on memes. Um, the term meme first appeared in 1976 in the interesting book called The Selfish Gene by a biologist called Richard Dawkins. And Sir Richard Dawkins described biological evolution from a very unusual point of view. He described it from the perspective of genetic material. He claimed that these little fellas, called genes, uses organisms like us, the human beings, animals, and all other life forms to help them replicate themselves. In the gene point of view, we are just vehicles for them. We are the surviving machines for genetic items. They use us and our bodies and sexual behavior to make themselves spread. But there was some phenomena Dawkins couldn't explain with genetic processes. Phenomena like languages strange rituals, fashion, 
technology or even religion. So cultural phenomena. For Dawkins, there has to be another replicator for this form of evolution he called cultural evolution. And cultural items, which were transmitted not by sex, like the genetic ones, but communication and mostly imitation of communication. We learn languages by imitation. We learn rituals by imitation. We imitate dances, how to make stuff, how to behave in certain contexts. And Dawkins called these cultural items, transmitted mostly by imitation, memes in analogy to genes. And a lot of memes shape our behavior in a very deep way. They are memes that make us believe and vote for or against something. They are memes which make us buy. Or memes that make us hate other people and forces us to fight in wars and risk even our own genetic material for such strange memes. But on the other side, there are memes too that raises our choices and quality of life. Memes that spread the concepts of equal rights, justice, empathy, or just love. And the interesting question for me is, can we handle memes like we try to handle genetic processes by genetic technology? Can we deconstruct memes to free ourselves from unwanted behavior like racism and other shit going on in this world? And why are some memes such contagious and others not? And in the end, you can use the whole mimetic theory in all kinds of fields in our everyday life economics, or politics, maybe branding, or at least maybe to share some more cat pictures. So I claim it again, memes are the source code of our culture and society. Funny internet memes are just a tiny part of it, but they share the same core functionality. The internet is a huge meme machine which makes diverse memes more visible and accelerates the speed of circulation. And the internet gives people access to read and write the global source code of culture and society. And that makes it so interesting for me. Thank you very much. We've done that one. And we've Stop done writing. One. And we've done that one. We've done that one. Oh, hi. Hi, Marcus. Would you like to shred a selfie? Yeah. Come on, shred a selfie. There we go. Let's go. Round who, of applause for Patrick. Who is it? Shredding I a selfie. Know. I don't know. It's just a teddy bear of somebody. So, um, a picture of a teddy bear being... Is it on? Is it shredding? Can we hear this? Yeah, just do that. So, how do you pronounce it? Meme. It's the right pronouncing because there are some scientists called... Richard Dawkins, but also Susan Blackmore, who wrote and talked a lot of mimetic processes. And they call it memes in the end. Okay. Because it's an analogy to genes. It's like a little scientific wordplay. It's not so funny, but they think oh, it's, it's funny. I think it's hilarious, that one. Um, it, yeah. What? I... Um, I, I did actually read your chapter. 
Really? I did, yeah. And I was, there's, a, there's a really nice, or it's not actually a nice thing, but it, it kind of shows what makes a meme so interesting. Did I say meme or mem? Meme. You have to call it meme. I have to say meme, because I always call it mem. I don't know why. Wrong. Or should I call it meme? Because <laughs> it's a meme. I call it meme. Yeah, it's cool. Do you, um, you, you, you write a little bit about um, the pepper spraying policeman. Yeah. Do you want to... Who knows the uh, pepper spraying cop? Yeah, yeah. Some, someone, I have to explain it. So, yeah, explain that. Uh, some years ago, there was this Occupy uh, Wall Street thing going on in the US and other countries in Europe and so on. And there was a, a campus of university. I, I don't know exactly where. I, I think Davis University. I don't I know. Um, so there was a very peaceful protest going on with all the students and they made a sit-in and the people blocked the way to the university or something like that. And there was a police officer of the campus police, so not the real police, uh, the campus police. And this guy, and the, the, the people were sitting there peacefully and singing protest songs and, 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 and such things. And then this police officer came, put out pepper spray and go through the row spraying the protesting peaceful people right in the face. And someone um, filmed it, put it on YouTube, and then a massive um, meme roll was going on because people started to make photos of this event and put it in different contexts. There was uh, the pepper spraying cop spraying Mickey Mouse Simpsons figures, but also uh, appeared in old art paintings and things like that. So this was a meme variation going on. And what's interesting about this picture, if you if you look, you know, if you go online and see it, is that the, the guy, the policeman, is just very casually doing it. <laughs> and that's the frightening thing about this picture. But it also is the thing that makes it a meme because you or meme. Damn it! Damn it! So hot here. I'd just like to thank the uh, the, uh, the 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 Hochschule um, for your tea towels, <laughs> because you have Dysons where you but you don't have towels. So, and it's hot. <laughs> so you now know what to do with a tea towel. So um, so and uh, but you couldn't have done that. That mem couldn't have hap- meme couldn't have happened if uh, if he hadn't have done it in that particular way. Yeah, I think, so. I think so, because he was very happy doing this. I think it was a joy for him to doing this. And I think this made people very angry. And I think there are different factors why memes are such successful. And one factor, there's a guy called Jonah Berger who described a model about why are memes successful, others are not. And one factor was um, emotion, and not only every emotion, high arousal emotion, like anger, for example. So people were very angry seeing that happy guy spraying peaceful protesters, and I think they got so angry that they started this anti-meme campaign against the guy. And I think he loses his job in the end. So... I mean, you, you, we, we, you talk a little bit about meme, uh, mem, memes. Damn it. Uh, memes being, like, obviously, we, every, everybody know, kind of, like, knows the, the one simply doesn't walk into Mordor meme, don't you? Yeah, I mean, no, and, and Grumpy Cat. We all know, who doesn't know Grumpy? No, who knows? We all know Grumpy Cat, right? I won't shame anybody for not knowing Grumpy Cat. But you also talk a little bit about, kind of, like, the, 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 the possibility to use memes for kind of political change or cultural change. So what exactly do you mean by that? How could that happen? Yeah, because memes are a very, have low barriers to, to share and to make. And it's like always a picture and, and a short sentence, a classical intimate meme, mm-hmm. we, we all know. And I think it's very easy to create them. And you have tools in the web like Meme Creator and something like that you can use ready memes and and, um, recontextualize them. And 
I think it's a very quick way to express feelings and, and protests and things going on. Um, you all know the Batman slapping meme. So if you, you, I thought you were angry the last days about the telecom, for example. I, I don't know. I, I read it in the internet. They, I was slightly disappointed with their performance. Yeah, poor. So, um, so you easily could make this kind of meme slapping the telecom, for example. I would never slap the telecom. No? Oh. I, talked, I talked briefly yesterday evening with um, a gentleman called Kevin from Te Telecom Hilft. <laughs> And I informed him that if he didn't fix my internet immediately, I would drive to Bielefeld, <laughs> drag him back down to Munich, and force him to fix it. He seemed quite confident that it would be fixed by the next day. So, I would never slap anyone. Oh. But, so this whole... So you, mm, could a political party use a meme? Hopefully not, because no, Obama used a lot of memes, I think. And it's quite, no, I'm not sure if it was very official, but I think some of the memes were um, officially uh, approved by the campaign team, like the Obama hope thing. Mm -hmm. I think he really liked this one because it's uh, a form of propaganda for, for him in the end. But I think Obama was one of the politicians for the first time who really used that stuff for his campaigning. And I think the secret is um, the, the shareability in these memes and information parts and bits. And I think um, they understood how to handle memes in the internet, even if they haven't created them by themselves, they um, make them share in the end. And so this was very successful, I think. What's your favorite meme? My favorite meme, oh God, I don't know. I really like Grumpy Cat, R Grumpy but Cat. It's, it's getting boring a little bit. I so. think it bores the hell out of Grumpy Cat. Yeah. It's pretty boring. Can you feel something? I feel it's getting very tired and more hot. It's getting tired, it's getting hot, but there's something I, else. I think we have to it's creeping lift up on it. the people a little bit up. We need to lift them up. I can feel, Joe, I think there's something coming kind of like Oh my oh. god, it's gamification! <laughs> Round of applause for the gamification section! This is Sparta! <laughs> oh. Okay, so let's do a little game called Pantomime. And the thing um, is oh. quite easy. I will um, get some of our authors on the stage, mm. and you have to guess which kind of meme they play by pantomime. Uh -huh. um, so Hang on. What, yeah. um, what do they win? I think uh, they win a nice can of fresh Wilde Hirsch. Wilde Hirsch, available right now at Edeka. <laughs> so, it's delicious. I've just tried it for the first time and I feel completely refreshed. Very good product pitch. Thank you very Round much. Round of applause for Wilde Hirsch. Come on! <laughs> so. Um... And to break the ice, I would start by myself. So I will do Hang on a minute, now. what do they need to do? Sorry, what do what? they need to do, Patrick? Uh, they, they have to scream it if they know, or they have to raise hands, I don't know. Uh, raising, do hands. Raising, raising hands, raising hands. Raising hands. Oh, no, and scream. then guess scream. What, what I will play and perform. Okay. So I start with the first meme. What was that? What was that? Who, who said that? Hello. What's your name? Nora. Nora. Yeah. And what's the meme? Crazy cat. No, it's not crazy cat. <laughs> That's wrong. Right. Oh, God, I've put on weight. <laughs> Hello, what's your name? Julian. Julian. Yeah, I think it's the grumpy cat. No, it's not grumpy cat. What's the matter with you? Hello, who are you? I don't know the exact description, but, but like something with your name? babies. What's your name? Annika. Annika. Yeah, some, some baby picture or something. Some baby. Like no, you mean success first? No, not that. No, no. Francis! <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> is it the awkward seal? <laughs> it looked like that. awkward seal. That's a meme I, I don't know. Do you I know give that? you a hint. It's 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 a girl. I'm it's, a girl. A girl. it's a girl. It's pretty it's a girl. hard with my hairy face. So it's a girl. It's a girl. 
Ah, oh, a girl knows. Oh, oh no, no, no. Uh, excuse me, ladies. Hello again. Hello. Are you drawing a Ville de Hersch? Yeah. Uh, available now at Edeka and Karlsruhe. Is it overly attached girlfriend? Yay! <laughs> Sorry, what was your name? Oh, hang on. I don't know. It's overly attached girlfriend. Oh, grumpy cat, Patrick. Grumpy yes, cat. So, it's about my hair and yeah, yeah, yeah. furry. So, what's your name? I'm getting drunk tonight, Isabel. Isabel's getting drunk tonight. Congratulations, Isabel. Yay. So, round of applause for Isabel. So. So our next meme will be presented, no, not you. <laughs> I'll give it's Thomas Sobach a um, chance. <laughs> <laughs> I hopefully think so. Is it right, Joe? The next will be the two. Yeah, it's I'm, oh, I'm look, totally right. Oh, hello. I oh, know the oh, show. Oh, so. this could go quite quickly. Okay, now watch. Okay, who knows this man? Okay. Yeah, oh, Frank. Frank, 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 Frank. What's your name? Frank. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Frank. Yeah. yeah. Merkel Obama. Yeah! Yay! Merkel Obama! <laughs> so now Thomas, I think. And you win. There you go. You win really? a... Really? A Wilde Hirsch. Wilde Hirsch. I beg your pardon? You have to drink it, Frank. There's no choice. You okay. have to drink it. It's uh, delicious. Next one, performed by... Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> you know it, 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 you know it. What's it? You look at it. Oh, I know it, I know it, I know it. What's your name? My name is Mr. Park. Mr. Park. Okay, oh. Mr. Park. I'm actually nice Korean. to meet you. Okay. You're actually Korean? Yes. Yeah, I'm actually English. Yeah, you know. Excellent. It. What is it? It's the fat Star Wars kid. It's Yay! Yay! He's not fat, he's just a little bit clumsy. Yeah. So. It has nothing to do with his weight. It's. <laughs> There you go, sir. Next one. My pleasure. So, will be presented by Andreas, and he will really have a hard job. So, give him. I can't remember what this. Oh, hello. Oh. Oh, hello. So, try to. Fix this <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> Who? Oh, come on. Nobody. Oh come on! I can, I can conf Yeah, it. <laughs> uh, yes. Hand up! Hand up! Hand up! Hand up! No! 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 I've been practicing this all afternoon. Your name, please. Susie. And how many cans of Wilderhaus have you drunk this evening? <laughs> Does my mom hear this? Or <laughs> no, it's not on video or anything. It's not on the internet. Look, would you like to say hello to your mum? Hey, Mom. <laughs> there you go. So which challenge is it? Sorry, which challenge is it? The ice bucket challenge. The ice Yay! bucket challenge! So there we go. So... <laughs> okay. So. And now the last one. Everybody has to come up oh, on stage. Oh. 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 And... When we finished this and showed you the solution, we want you to repeat the same thing that we did after we show you the solution, or while we show you the solution. Uh, so, uh, Patrick, Patrick, um, yes? Patrick, before you uh, start, yeah. can I just say something briefly? Just even if you know what it is, and trust me, because you will understand what I mean when you see it. Just let them do it a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so does anybody know what it is? It's hard, isn't it? Now keep going, and I haven't worked it out yet. 
Come on, keep going, keep going. So who knows what it is? You look like you know what it is. Come on, let's go in here. You haven't had anything to drink all evening. What's your name? Robin. Robin, what is it? It's the Harlem Shake. It's the Harlem Shake! Everybody, do the Harlem Shake! Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, there we go. Well, Joe, thank you all very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Massive round of applause for our authors. Robin, you're going to get your video house any minute now. So thank you very much for coming. Um, stay, have some drinks, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much, and good night.